This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. I was trying to get an idea. I want them dead presidents. I want to pull up. Head spin. Get it, get flat. I got six jobs. I don't get it. And we're still not tired here on Two Bad Hombres, episode number eight of the podcast now already. Doc and I are here. I am your host, Vito Jerome Turco, alongside the Doc from Doc and Jock. That is John Macaroon. John, how's it going? Look at that professional fade out. Don't you like that? Running the board efficiently, learning as I go along here to make this podcast one of the finest on the network, Vito. As always, I look forward to chatting with you about the week that was. Looking forward to the weekend. But uh, did you get a chance to enjoy the beautiful weather in the last week? My goodness. For me, it was kind of irritating because I was at work. The practice was booming. And the busiest day for me is Saturday, in essence. So getting outside in between clients was so beautiful to get out there and walk around. But last Saturday, when it was that nice, 62 degrees or higher in Michigan, I was cooped up from 9 a.m. up until about 7 p.m., client after client. And I was like, wow, man, really? People were talking about golfing. People were talking about enjoying the nice weather. I was a guy working hard. I didn't get a chance to enjoy it. But in the last week, got a chance on Wednesday to go outside and have a good time and do a lot of things with the family, play on the slides, get outside. It's one of those things where you got to take advantage of it. Were you playing on the slides by yourself? (laughs) (laughs) No, I get up on the slides and go down with my kids. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm I'm joking. (laughs) Anyways, you know, in that theme song there, do they say, I want them bad or dead presidents? I want them dead presidents. What did, what did he say there? There's something about dead dead presidents? I have to look up the lyrics. I want to look up the lyrics eventually. I'm not trying to get myself in trouble. I know. No, I think it's kind of funny. No, I think it's kind of funny anyways. so And people, I think, can tell what is said there. So we'd be in trouble, and we probably are in trouble anyways. But piggybacking now on what you were saying about the beautiful weekend, the beautiful weather and temperature on Saturday, specifically throughout the state of Michigan, I was able to go out even though I had a cold, a nagging cold. So, hey, I know you were you know caught up inside doing work all day. Well, I had the cold, but was able to go outside and work all day for the free press covering three separate events. Now, two of them were at Callahan Hall for the Public School League. Now, high school basketball, girls and boys, back-to-back championship games in the Public School League, and covered those two for the Free Press at Callahan Hall, historic Callahan Hall. And then before that, earlier in the day, I had the opportunity and a great opportunity at that to meet Tommy Hitman Hearns. How about that? I mean, that was quite the experience for me because I've never met, you know, uh, actually I met a professional boxer the day before, which is funny, Tony Harrison, who is going for the World Junior Middleweight title now on Saturday night. It will be televised on Fox you should watch. He is 24-1, a guy from Detroit, Detroit's own Detroit bread. Anyways, Tommy Hitman Hernzo met him on Saturday. A great individual to me, has done a lot for the city of Detroit. A guy who won seven world titles in boxing. I mean, quite the boxer. A legacy that is, is just unprecedented. I mean, it's just, it's historic. And his legacy will live on forever as a boxer. And for what he's done and his contributions to the city of Detroit. So what I was at was a street renaming in his honor, which was right at the site of the old Kronk Gym, this historic legendary gym where Thomas Hitman Hearns trained, where Hilmer Kenty, the first guy that Emmanuel Stewart, the legendary Hall of Fame trainer who passed away in 2012, he trained Kenty to a world title in boxing. That was the first guy that he trained to a world championship. Then he trained and most famously trained Thomas Hitman Hearns. Well, Stewart really established that old Kronk gym. And that is located on McGraw Avenue. And McGraw Avenue was renamed Thomas Hitman Hearns Avenue in honor of the Hitman himself because of all his great contributions to the city of Detroit throughout the years. And I was able to make a long story short, I was able to cover that event for the Detroit Free Press on Saturday afternoon, an event that kicked off at 1 p.m. And eventually, after all the talking was done, uh, including Hitman Hearns himself talking to everybody who had uh, joined him to support him for that day, I was able to talk to Tommy himself. And what a great guy to talk to. It was a very short combo. But to start off 
my chat, before I even got into any questions that I asked him, he actually made a joke with me really quick that I wanted to bring up to all of you. And he said to me, do you have two bucks on you? He was joking with me, obviously, and he got a laugh out of me. I shook his hand and then asked my question for the piece that I wrote about the street renaming that was done or street christening, as it was called in the piece, in the headline of the piece that I wrote for the Free Press on Saturday. It was a great event, a great day for the event and a great event to cover for the free press. So that was one of my three stories that I did once again for the free on Saturday, a great day of great weather in the state of Michigan, to say the least, Doc. So were you starstruck a little bit? Were you able to kind of get through the interview? Did you feel like you were able to be professional enough to kind of ask the questions without stumbling or get the information that you wanted to get during the interview? How would you assess the time that you spent with the hitman? I would assess it as terrific in terms of the experience face-to-face, one-on-one with him. And there was other people around him, a bunch of his supporters from over the years, his friends, family members. I mean, people showed up in droves to support him. It was a great showing of support for Mr. Herms. But for me, I felt comfortable. I felt it went very well to the one-on-one talk there, which lasted for less than two minutes, I bet. Honestly, me and him talking together. And hopefully now we're able to get Mr. Herms inside this very studio for an episode of Two Bad Hombres in the near future, which maybe maybe is in the works. Maybe is in the works. We don't know for sure. Can't guarantee it, though. So, Vito, I'm very interested, knowing that you talked to Tony Harrison, Thomas Hitman Hearns. Do you have an interest in boxing, mixed martial arts, professional wrestling? I never knew if you had any interest in professional boxing or of uh, sports like that, contact sports. Are you interested in, in a sport like that? I have an interest in sparring myself and boxing one day, like Beat from the Howard Stern Show. You know oh, about yeah. Beetlejuice. Isn't, oh, he, yeah? isn't he funny? They've put him out there to try to box and made him believe that he's a boxer, a great boxer that has knocked out all the greatest boxers of all time. It's hilarious seeing how they deal with Be- Beetlejuice that is on the Howard Stern Show, a show that I know you and I both like to listen to on the radio, obviously, Sirius XM, which I've lost. I lost my subscription to Sirius XM because it was free. I was using up the free subscription in my new Chevy Cruze, now that's gone. I am away from Howard. I've been away from Howard for too long. And now it's on me. I guess the onus is on me, right, to pay up, right, for that subscription again to SiriusXM. Well, you know what, Vito? If you really look at it, it's not worth it because Howard Stern basically broadcasts two weeks a month and takes the other know, two weeks takes off. takes so much time, It's right? unbelievable the amount of time he takes off. I understand the dude is old. He's been broadcasting for the better part of three to four decades, but in essence, if you're a fan of Howard Stern, he just takes a lot of vacation. It's not, it's not <laughs> worth it. It really isn't. I hear that he's coming up with the video service to kind of maybe further adjunct his show and the entertainment services that he provides. So listen, that guy is a broadcast genius. He's a legend. He's a pioneer. There's no doubt about it. But in 2017, many people are looking at him like maybe, just maybe, he sold out a little bit to get in favor with celebrities because... That's not the same guy. I had the same subscription that you had for a few months that was free, and I let it go too. But that's not the same Howard Stern. That's not the guy that had women ride the Sibian. That's not the same guy that had women do some things on the air. This is a guy now that's also, he's not only is a provocateur, no doubt about it. That's kind of what drew me to him. But right now, what he's focusing in on is another one of his really great strengths is that he's a magnificent interviewer. When anyone spends an hour with him, he can get a lot of information out. You get a sense like you're sitting in the room there just listening to a conversation. But for me, you know, I've heard it thousands of times. I've heard him interview a lot of people. So I was more into him for the wildness, the the fact of like, hey, <laughs> what's he going to say next? Stuff. The yeah. raunchy stuff. Now it's more like, hey, he's catering to celebrities. He wants to know all these details. And he's still one of the funniest people on the air. But if you look at it right now, a subscription to Sirius is not really 100% worth it. I know there's some shows that I would like. The Sam and Jim Roberts show, I would really enjoy. The 80s music channel. But all in all, as compared to what's out there available for free, it's not worth it to me. I want Venus. Venus again. I like that. That's channel three. You have a lot of good channels on there on Sirius XM. And it's that music you can listen to with no commercials. I love that, man. Because then I go... Now that I'm back to regular AM, FM radio stations, you get all those commercials, all the same songs played all over again. The songs you don't want to listen to, like Too Much Rap by 95.5, 98.7. And I like some rap, but some of the new rap songs, Fetty Wap. I'm not a big fan of Fetty, and I'm sorry if I offend anybody here about Fetty, but I don't believe he's a great rapper. I think he's pretty basic, just kind of, I don't know, it just isn't good. doesn't come off very well. 
Now, this Two Bad Hombres podcast I'm looking forward to. We have a great guest coming up. You'll tell us about that. But after we talk to our guest, I want to bring up this article because, listen, the, the stuff that you sent me, with all due respect, is great. I want to talk about it, but basically— It ain't as good as what you have prepared way, for Way, way too political. I want to talk about this article I read on the Detroit News earlier in the week regarding millennials and how they trail their parents financially. I think it encompasses a lot of what you also are interested in, and it's a, just really something that's really concerning— is the fact that we are on the verge of a generation not performing as well as their parents, which would be the first time in the history of this country where a generation of people do not do as well as their parents. It's really concerning, and it's it's something I want to talk to you about after we talk to our esteemed guest. Aaron McMahon of MLive.com and his first year on the Pistons beat for MLive.com. will be joining us very quickly after this commercial break. Oh, wait, are we going to trap him? Are we going to try to get him to say anything about a trade? Or are we we'll going to try... See. We'll see what he says. We're hoping he gives some kind of info. I don't know what he knows, but we'll see what he knows after this commercial break. Doc here for the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Thank you for your continued support and allowing us to keep the studio lights on, the microphones hot here at the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. If you like what you're listening to, you like the variety of podcasts that you hear, definitely check out our website, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. That's the easiest way to support us. You get all the news from the network. You can check out the work from Vito, myself, all the guys that are putting out great content almost each and every day. And hey, if you're prone to shop online, click through that Amazon banner, go about your business, shop, and then when you're on that Amazon page, just bookmark it. Anytime at all that you make an online purchase, it kicks us back a little something and helps us keep this project going. We've been going strong since 2013, and that's been largely due to the support of our supporters, and we greatly appreciate it. DetroitSportsPodcast.com. And now joining me on episode number eight of Too Bad Hombres is Aaron McMahon, Pistons beat writer for MLive.com. Aaron, how's it going today? I'm good. It's a beautiful day outside, mid-February, sunshine, and can't, can't complain a whole lot. Aaron, there is not a lot to complain about, well, maybe besides for the Pistons. Uh, all season long in the first half, standing at 27-30, and 30, uh, a 50-win season is not going to happen. Sadly, I predicted it in a blog for Detroit Athletic Company. I don't know what you had thought about the Pistons going into the season, but how much, in your opinion, have they underachieved to this point? Yeah, I, I think there's no question they've underachieved. You know, if you ask if you ask Stan Van Gundy, if you ask you know some of the players, they'll they'll say the same thing. The question just becomes how much, and like you mentioned, and that's kind of you know I guess the uh, the big question, and I think it's kind of hard to determine at this point. You know, they, this is a roster that hasn't really been intact much uh, most of the season. You know, they went the first twenty twenty one games without Rick Jackson. He was suffering from knee tendonitis. Uh, he's come back and he looked good in spurt, but uh, there have been others where it's clear his knee and his speed isn't where it was, you know, one one season ago. Um, he, he, John Lewis missed a few games of injury. KCP missed a few games of injury. Um, there was that tension there midway through the season when Reggie came back, uh, where they were kind of shuffling around some of the forwards. So the lineup hasn't really been, or the, excuse me, the rotation really hasn't been um, most of the season. Which I think is, is, is bothered Stan Van Gundy a little bit. You know, he's a guy of consistency. He doesn't like changing much. He likes, you know, riding out the guys and, and, you know, finding, I guess, their, their true water level. I don't think they've really been able to do that much this season. Um, you know, he, he pointed out last week that, and it still holds true. You know, they're, they're one game worse than they were at this point last season. So, you know, all is not lost. They're, they're, they're in the eighth seed right now in the East. Uh, they're only a couple games back of the, of the 60s. So, you know, there's there's still a chance there. They're healthy at this point. They've got 25 games left for regular season. There's, there's no point they better cheat. Um, now it's a matter of, you know, do they have enough time to put together? Now, Aaron, a lot of people are looking at the move that was made between Sacramento and New Orleans. Now, the Pistons also have a role in this in that rumors kind of came out and there was speculation that the Pistons had offered Sacramento Andre Drummond for DeMarcus Cousins. But how should the people feel, how should the fans feel, knowing that potentially Sacramento denied that trade? And when people look to improve the Pistons, one of the two pieces that we look to move is Reggie Jackson or and Andre Drummond. And if other teams aren't willing to take those guys, how should we really sit here feeling today? Yeah, you, you know, it's, it's a good question. But if you look, I think if you look at what Sacramento did, you know, they unloaded DeMarcus for, you know, and they've gotten a flat for the sense, but they, they essentially didn't give up a whole lot. You know, they gave up three guys who 
you know, or maybe, maybe, you know, mid, mid the borderline starters and then the first round draft pick. It, to me, on the out here, you know, it looks like Sacramento's looking to rebuild. You know, it, had they made that trade for Andre, that certainly wouldn't be a rebuild. That'd be basically, you know, inserting X for X and trying something else. But it's essentially the, the same thing. So, you know, to me, uh, Sacramento made the decision to kind of, you know, re- rebuild and restart. Um, so I don't know if that necessarily looks bad on, on Drummond's part for, for Drummond's value or anything. Um, I think DeMarc is probably one of the more underrated big men in the league. You know, and maybe and some of that may be to his detriment, you know, with his his, uh, his, his activity on the court and the number of tentacles and his, you know, his mean spirit is anger sometimes, you know. So I, I don't think that necessarily looks bad, so much bad as it does on Andre as the result with Sacramento. You know, with what ended up happening, I think they they were looking to do a certain thing. Uh, had, maybe had they gotten a little bit more value than the market is worth, maybe they would have you know traded up. But in this sense, they traded down, and and I don't blame them. It looks like they had an an, an angle to to, uh, to accomplish, and they really get it. So I don't think that looks too much, too bad. Okay, so what's been your perception and assessment of SVG trying to shop Reggie Jackson and or Andre Drummond? to try and improve this team because when we look at it, people are kind of debating, well, should we continue to invest in this Piston team? Should we jump off the bandwagon? Maybe it's time to maybe start looking to the future instead of success maybe here in 2017. Yeah, no, that, that's a good, it, it, and it's been brought up, but I don't know how serious the, you know, that's the thing. You know, a lot of times behind the scenes, you, you know, you, you hear these leaks of these trade, you know, trade possibilities between two teams, but then you don't hear about the other seven trade, league, you know, trade offers that, Maybe the Pistons have been offered. You know, so we're we're kind of you know hearing drips and drabs of, of certain things. We don't know of you know of potential offers elsewhere. Sports Illustrated reported that Toronto Raptors had actually offered the Jonas Valanciunas for Andre Drummond. So and you don't know how many of those other offers are out there. So you know you're hearing these things. Are the Pistons serious? They could be. You know, they obviously aren't where they want to be. Um, they got a lot of money tied up in, in Reggie and Andre. And, and you know, rightfully so. I think they would have gotten the money, uh, maybe not as you know, at least with, not in Reggie's case, but Andre would have gotten the money no matter where he was at. A lot of times you'll hear, you'll see guys, guys will be you know valued. They'll be put on the trade market just to, to get their value, and you don't really hear about it. Dan knows what he's doing. He he, he has a good um, assessment on you know value of guys and where they're headed in terms of their career you know trajectories. You know, Reggie's kind of up in there at this point in his leg. You know, have we have we seen him? Um, top out, we may have. You know, last season may have been his first in the NBA. You know, he looked pretty good. He was a, a you know, borderline All Star point guard in, in the Eastern Conference. Um, and has it was that was that the Reggie Jackson? You know that you know we were hoping for, and you know as he bond out, we'll see. Doc, there's nothing better than McMahon and M and M's. And especially Honey Nut M&M's, as we have those in studio right now here as we're recording this interview with the lovely, the great Aaron McMahon from MLive.com, the Pistons beat writer. And Aaron, hey, how has it been in your first year covering the Pistons, on the beat, specifically covering the Pistons for MLive.com? It's been good. You know, a lot of uh, a lot of work, a lot of hard work. You know, you don't get many days off, especially with, you know, the, the seasons where, you know, they, they, they practice or play, you know, four or five times a week. And then, you know, you might get one off day a week, but then you end up traveling. So it's been a lot of work, a lot of travel. I'm getting, starting to get used to it. You know, it's, but it's been fun. You know, you, uh, you get to meet people and see things, you know, you don't normally see as a, as a fan or, you know, someone that's kind of in the outskirts. So it's been good. You know, it's, I, I, I tell people all the time, but this, is, this is what I want to do growing up. I want to cover a team. I want to be a beat guy. So to kind of live out your dreams, so to speak, has been, been fun. What are the best perks of the gig, Aaron? <laughs> that's a good, that's a good <laughs> question. Probably the the tr- the, I got two things. Obviously, the travel is 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 cool. You know, you get to see places. I, I've been to so many cities I haven't been before. Um, you know, you, you, you know, you get all the flights and the and the miles and the per- hotel perks and all that stuff. Um, but but the one underrated thing, and and I, I haven't told many people, but getting to shoot hoops on some of these NBA, you know, we'll cover shoot around in the morning and talk to players and you know do our interviews and stuff. But then but then you know the team leaves, they're done, and the, the court's wide open. A lot of times you basketball there, so. Sometimes those people, people letters get a, you know opportunity to shoot around a little bit on the court. So you know you can shoot hoops at you can shoot hoops at Madison Square Garden and Staples Center and some of these historic venues and buildings that you know so much has happened in is it, it, kind of it's kind of cool too. So I guess right now you have more perks than me uh, hosting a podcast here for the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Um, <laughs> anyway, so Aaron. <laughs> You know what? I wanted to also uh, put this out there to the listeners and to you. You know, my premise here regarding, you know, whether or not to trade Reggie or to trade Andre is that 
Reggie, you know, because he's having a down year statistically almost all across the board and was hurt to start the season, his trade value is way down. And compared to last year going into this season, it's way down. So I'm thinking, why not? keep him for next year then if they're out of it next year at the deadline like they are kind of this year then you trade him at next year's deadline whereas in contrast you have Andre Drummond who really his numbers are uh, in relation or really right there with his career norms especially in rebounding his rebounding numbers are always going to be there and they are there this year as well so it seems like Drummond has much more value so why not deal him and do you feel that way as well if you were Van Gundy in his shoes would you have the same mindset as me regarding whether or not to trade Reggie or Andre? I would say, yeah, you're going to go with the guy who has more value, who has the larger contract. And this is something we, you know, we've kind of talked to other beat writers and I've talked to other people about with, with Reggie. You know, this is the second time he got his injection in, in his knee to, to, to clear tendonitis. Um, he got it a couple of years ago when he was in Oklahoma City. Um, but the difference between that time and this time is he had a couple months. That was a season where Andy had, had, a, had a strike and a lockout. So he had some time to Kind of recuperate, sit at home, and, and and rest the knee. He never really got that here. You know, he had his his, uh, his three months, uh, or excuse me, he had two months, two three months of, uh, of kind of like getting you know getting acclimate, you know, getting acclimated and everything else and, and recuperating. But he didn't really, he didn't have that time where you, know, you go through training camp, you go through the preseason, you kind of progressively get into the swing of the season. He never got that. You know, he he, he got injured or he decided to do the injection during training camp, beginning of training camp, really. Um, then he gets kind of thrown in the the fire, so to speak, you know, 21 games in. Uh, so, you know, he never really got that. And I, I'd be curious to see how his knee reacts, how his speed, if it does return, um, you know, with, with a summer to recuperate. So that, that, I, that is a possibility. He may turn out to be, you know, the guy we saw last year, you know, with, with a summer off. That may be the situation. That may be how Stan Van Gundy feels. In fact, he's on the record saying he is south and, and led you in getting his speed in his first back. But I don't know. You know, I'm not saying I'm not in his shoes. I'm not behind closed doors where he's talking with General Manager Jeff Bauer. Maybe they simply we don't. Maybe they, you know, maybe they feel, you know, like he won't get it back. You know, who, who knows at this point? And Aaron, let's play a quick game of Big Vito's over under a very popular game all nationwide. We know that much. I know you know that from being on Tiger's Talk in the past. And we call it <laughs> yeah. Big Vito's over under because you know I am Big Vito too. So, anyways. <laughs> I have to ask you about over or under 50% for Reggie being traded and over or under 50% for Andre being traded. Sure. Sure. With, with Reggie, I'd say under 50%, just, just based, like you said, based, based on his, uh, his that trade value. I think it's down based on some of these trade rumors. I don't, there hasn't been a, a you know, a knockout trade that might benefit the Pistons. So I'm going to say under with Reggie, um, with Andre, I'd say slightly over, just like you said, based on value and, and and everything else. So yeah, under for Reggie, over for, for Andre. So Aaron, really quick, before I let you go, will the Pistons make the playoffs this year? And if so, as what seed in the Eastern Conference? I think they do. And, and I've said this for about a month or two now, I still think they're deeper and a better team than they were last year uh, for the injuries and the reacclimation with the offense with Reggie Miss Smith. I, I think they're, they're a pretty good team. You know, they're the eighth seed right now. They're only uh, a game back at seven. I think they're a couple games back at six. 25 games left, I do think they get in the playoffs. I'm going to say seven seed. I, I don't think they make the leap of six, but at the same time, East is mediocre, you know, and it kind of was last year. So I think it's a, it's a good opportunity for the Pistons to make a move, and I, I think they will. I think they get in. Well, Aaron, I thought I had the last question, but my co-host wants to get something in first, so here is Doc with the last question, actually. Yeah, more importantly, sure. let's say I get in touch with Cletus, and I say, hey, listen, after the Pistons are done practicing, we got Aaron McMahon versus Rod Beard, one-on-one. Who takes it down in a uh, one-on-one matchup there? You know, it's funny, because we'll shoot hoops all the time after 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 practice together. Um, he's probably got the, the better jump shot, more consistent jump shot, but I'd say uh, athletically and, and, and just speed-wise, I think I'd... Uh, I think I'd be able to take him. So you take him about 11-7, you think? Uh, sure, yeah, sure, 11-7. I'll go, <laughs> I'll go with that. Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. Great work. We enjoy your work over there at MLive. You can follow Aaron on Twitter, at Aaron McMahon. Always a great chat. Best of luck, and we look forward to talking down the line here. Absolutely, guys. Thanks for, thanks for having me.
That was a great Aaron McMahon. Now, it's been a long time since we had him on the other podcast, Tiger's Talk, that you and I co-host. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stir it up, too. You know what I'm tweeting right now. You know what my next tweet's going to be, right? What's it going to be? What did I do? I'm, I'm going to tell, may- <laughs> tell Rod that Aaron thinks he can Oh, you him. should stir it up. Without him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely you should. And speaking of stirring it up, how about the latest presidential rankings from a C-SPAN poll? Now, I know you have, like, no interest whatsoever. Look at you. I knew you were going to okay. express that in your face. Okay, we'll get to the Millennials talk real oh, quickly, but yes, tell yes. me the rankings because yeah, I so know I wanted, you, you prepared it. Th- you know what, Doc? Thank you very much for that. So wanted to get to it, and really, really quick here, guys. This C-SPAN survey of 91 presidential historians ranked Commander-in-Chief, number 44, Barack Obama, as the 12th best president in U.S. history, only a month after he stepped out of the Oval Office. Now, it's the best ranking for any president since Ronald Reagan, who ranks ninth in the new survey and ended his two-term presidency in 1989. Now, as a few other notes, Abraham Lincoln has been number one in all three editions of the poll that have come out. So the first one came out in 2000, the second in 2009, and the third this year in 2017. And number two... Big note here is George Washington started out at number three in 2000 and has been ranked the second best press in the last two polls. And now FDR, Theodore Roosevelt, and Dwight Eisenhower follow three through five in the top five presidents of all time. And President's Day just happened this past Monday. And speaking of favorite presidents of all time that we've encountered or have learned about, my two favorite of all time are JFK, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, and Barack Obama. Remember, Kennedy was the first Roman Catholic president, and there's been none since because of fears of an individual taking orders from the Vatican while in the White House. Remember, he was the youngest president ever elected at 43. He got the U.S. out of the Cuban Missile Crisis in October of 62, the same month and year in which my mother was born. And that Cuban Missile Crisis, remember, Doc, if you're not too up on your history, it is when the Soviet Union had nuclear missiles stationed in Cuba facing the U.S. And if the Soviets would have gone along with the missile launch, it would have meant no too bad hombres or Detroit Sports Podcast Network. So remember that. So JFK should be at the top, right? Just because of that. And then Obama, well, what hasn't he done? Because, well, he can play basketball. He's got handsome looks, can talk. One of the best orators of all time, right? Can give a great speech. And remember that the unemployment rate, as the end of his two terms in office neared, the unemployment rate stood at 4.6% the lowest it's been since August of 07, and a drastic improvement when compared to unemployment levels hovering near 10% during Obama's first two years as president. So a lot of good stuff. And you can look at that the job creation. When you compare the number of jobs when Obama took office in January of 09, with the total that existed before he left office, you'll see that the difference is a net gain of 11.3 million jobs. That's much better than the 2.3 million that George W. Bush created during his eight years in office. So Obama, once again, also as the first African-American president in U.S. history, also did a lot of good. And those two, Obama and JFK, are my two favorite presidents of all time. That is all she wrote. Doc, do you have a favorite president or two, though, really quick, in honor of President's Day here on Two Bad Hombres. Obviously, I got two. I got uh, Bill Clinton, for obvious reasons, and then <laughs> Ronald Reagan. We're getting his Bill Clinton on in the White House, right? No, I think he was because a great leader. Mon- I think he had like great... what he did with No, Monica. I think he had great persuasion skills, and I think he Persuasive was... Persuasive with the women I think in was, the White House. I think he was a strong leader, and I think he exuded confidence, and uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Mr. Bill Clinton, and I'm also a big fan of Ronald Reagan. I think that uh, Reaganomics and in terms of what he did in the 80s also helped this country greatly. And we're still maybe feeling the effects of it now because, you know, the basis of the Republican Party and some of their economic policies are from the 1980s as well. But uh, why are you interested in this? I'm curious. I'm very interested because as a millennial, I wouldn't expect a guy like you to care about the rankings. I would think and assume that you'd be interested in the top strip clubs in the area or the top nightclubs in the area or the top uh, or the top adult establishments that you can go to and have a nice cocktail. Why do you care who ranks as the top president? I'm very interested. 
Well, C-SPAN is a very valid source. And I'm trying to become presidential myself for my own run for the presidency in, I don't know what year it would be. I know why I watch C-SPAN. I'm trying to sound educated. I'm trying to be more educated about politics and about our presidents of the past. Do you know the only wave of time that I ever watched C-SPAN was? Was when Howard Stern would send his goonies to call. Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. I I needed to say that. Prank call it. Exactly. You know, when he would send his goonies to uh, prank CNN or MSNBC or C-SPAN, it was hilarious. They'd have some of these boring hosts kind of take calls and these these guys would come in with the most hilarious bits out there. It was so funny. <laughs> so dirty. Because oh, they're so monotone, so dull, and they, they bore you to sleep. Now, do you know I'm what the best prank was of all time was though? He what actually happened? had somebody call, I think, ABC and prank um the ABC news coverage when OJ was doing his thing on the Ooh. Yeah, they called during up the said, during huh? the Bronco chase, huh? On live chase. TV, man. That would have been something to see. I wasn't alive or I was but very, very young. I was born in ninety three, remember. But anyways, what did you have for me about millennials? Final topic here. I know it's an abbreviated edition, but uh, among the six jobs, we got to get to some of them because we're doing great things here at the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. But I saw an article, and I was perusing the Detroit News, the Detroit Free Press, great newspapers in town, ones that I read thoroughly each and every day. And good job to you. Kudos to you for that preview piece you did on the prep high school sports. Good job this week at the Free Press. I'm very proud of you, and uh, always continue to tag us. It's really good. I enjoy your work, and you did a really good job. I was impressed. Special to the Detroit Free Press. Do you like Vito that title? Turco. I love I that title. I am special. You are Very special. special. The special needs person. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the Free Press. That's what it means without putting needs in there. No, Anyways. No. Listen, it's really good to have these programs where special needs people can get jobs. And then it's stuff that the Free Press does offer that to me. It's nice. Such a nice entity. That's why it's never going to close down. That's awesome. But anyways, <laughs> to you now, to the real point of this discussion. Yeah, it was an article in discussing millennials and how, and many people are talking about it. And the reason why people are looking at it is economically, one of the reasons why Donald Trump is in office now is a lot of people did vote for him solely on the basis of their belief that he could help them put more green in their pocket. Not the weed variety, but the cash. There's been studies that have been conducted, and it's just the numbers are coming back more and more that people are leaving college, people are graduating with a high amount of debt. And they're getting jobs where they're still making sandwiches after college. They're still in a situation financially where they're not saving. They're not putting money away. You know, Vito, the numbers are staggering. On average, workers earned $40,581 in 2013. That's compared with the average of $50,910 that young adults earned in 1989. Now, they've adjusted for inflation and all that, but, you know, the thesis was you can't earn 20% less income and have the same standard of living as a generation passed. And as we look, and as I see things, I can understand why. And the reason it's so concerning to me is I see some of the traits that allow these millennials not to succeed. I mean, millennials sometimes tend to value a lot of time off. They sometimes don't value time in in terms of showing up on time. The biggest factor, though, is the respect for leadership. A lot of people feel entitled, like they should walk in out of college and be the vice president of the company. It doesn't work like that. Well, I thought that's what I'm doing here, by the way, with the DSP network. That's what I'm talking to you about, is that (laughs) you have some of those traits, not pronounced, they're not terrible, but I would say if you look at some coverages that we're doing here, there's been a vast difference. And of course, there's reasons for all that, and you know... There's, it's obvious. It's You're no, not going to air out your dirty laundry about no, me right now on air, no, of course you? not. But we already did that last week, you already on know last week's it. episode. Yeah. You, you already know. Yep. But the thing is, is what I think people need to hear is, in order to succeed, if you want to make 30000 60000 100000 you have to have an undying focus in terms of what you're doing. Okay? There should be no excuses. Um, if you have a task to do, you go out and do it. If you have something in terms of a job that you're going to be in an entry level, a boss is not going to want to keep somebody around and move them up if they take time off, you know, for opening day, for example. If they want to take time off for all these concerts. You got to have a situation where I think millennials are going into jobs too in careers that don't pay. Okay, whether it be maybe in radio, maybe whether it be in uh journalism early on. And everything that I do. No. Yep. Or other type things where early it takes a long ass time. And I think millennials also are willing to stay at home and not have bills. They're not willing to take on a ton of responsibility. Whereas for me, I was 23 years old, I had a mortgage, and I was ready to go. For me, I was forced because of family circumstances to take on that task, but it helped me. In that, I was forced to get a job, I was forced to have responsibilities, I was forced to learn about mortgages and how to take advantage 
of certain situations and how to deal with your family and all that kind of stuff. So I was forced to learn these things. And now being here, you know, sitting on my soapbox here at uh, 37, almost 38 years old, and looking at what young people do and the young people that I talk to and counsel, there's a big disparity gap that I see in terms of what they need to do in order to be successful. And it's, it's, it's shocking that a lot of young people are not taking advantage of, of what opportunities are out there. And so I do believe, though, young people have an opportunity to go out there and hustle and do a lot of things. But you got to be smart out there. You got to take advantage of some opportunities out there. But the way it looks right now, Vito, a lot of young people are at a disadvantage and this generation is likely not to succeed as much as uh, past generations. We're all going to fail. We all suck. My generation just sucks. And you know what? We're no Do you good. agree with that? What do you think we about millennials? We deserve just to go and jump off a cliff. The thing is about millennials nowadays is, hey, think about this, though. College tuition, what it is, and then loan debt. Subsequently, it adds up and becomes so high at times for these college students graduating nowadays, such as myself, that we can't afford to live on our own after college. So that's our built-in excuse. I know it, but it is true. It's a valid reason. It's not some alternative fact created by the Trump administration. It's a true thing. When you look at the college debt out there for the normal graduating student, graduating with a bachelor's degree, it is sky high, at least, what, 40 to 50K now for everybody graduating from college? There's something that has to be done about that because the bubble is going to burst one day where the tuition is going to go up so high and the debt's going to be so astronomically high that students are going to start actually skipping out on college and going into the trades field more and more and going into hard manual labor because they can't afford college and even with a parent assisting them because the parents can't afford to put their name on a loan either. Look at these stats from the Detroit News um, done by research at the uh, St. Louis Federal Reserve. There's an increase in 25-year-olds living with their parents. 40% of graduates around the time of the recession ended up being underemployed. That means taking on jobs they were overqualified for. And from 2012 to 2013, almost half of millennials were living at home, compared with only a quarter of the same age adults in 1999. So you guys are just superior, and I give you props for doing what you did. You moved out right away at 23 and had your own house, had a mortgage, you said? You know, Vito, being Middle Eastern, we stay with our parents. So what ended up happening was my father passed away when uh-huh. I was 23. Uh-huh. So I just took, uh, I took over the existing mortgage that was going on. So it was on me. The burden was on me to get a job and work and take care of my family. At the time, my sister was just getting married. So she stayed in the house for about two weeks prior to moving out with her husband. So it was then on me. And it was me and my mom living together. But I was the one taking care of the bills. So it's one of those things where now that I got married, I just continue to stay in the same house. And my mother now lives with my sister. We're a patriarchal, matriarchal society where we want to keep our family close. So it's not me living with my mom and her paying the bills. It was, in essence, I took over and then started the process of... To help out your mom because she couldn't pay for it herself probably too anyways. And I know to be the man of the house, you became the man of the house. I became the man of the house. Unfortunately, the way that you did, not the way you wanted to become the man of the house. Not the way I wanted to, but uh, it taught me a lot of lessons because in essence, I might have fallen down that similar pattern of staying at home a long time because I didn't get married until I was 31. And I wasn't so you could have been. So probably you and I both. When I'm 31, you'll be at my wedding. We'll talk about this again when I'm But when don't I'm you there. think, though, millennials could do a little bit more? I mean, they're Well, the thing is, what am I going to do if I don't have a, a sufficient income? I do a lot of stuff. But see, now here's the thing. Right? Like, okay, now I got a, I got a philosophical question. And, yes. I, and I give your parents credit for helping you out. No doubt about it. And you best be saving your money. And yeah. we'll talk about that. But let's say you didn't have your parents around. Yep. Let's say they wanted to go to Florida. You would then be forced to then get more income. See, Vito, that's how I think life works, in that you have the opportunity to stay at home. It might not be the best thing for you in terms of your progress, knowing that you could go out there and get a higher paying job or take on more jobs that actually, you know, sustain a living that you need to become accustomed to. And plus, maybe the fact is you need to see what's out there. Maybe you need to come to my home and see what it's like because I got a bomb ass house and I've worked (laughs) hard for it. A nice backyard, nice porch, nice basement that I still haven't finished yet, but I was thinking about that earlier today and that maybe you need to see what uh, these nice what homes it takes like, what by, it's gonna by take by living in your house for a day by you taking me in and you can't live in my house no 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 way. I'm gonna live in your house now actually you invited me there I'm gonna go. tell your wife that you I'm be in. my roommate I'll, I'll charge in. you eight hundred dollars a month rent <laughs> <laughs> well while you love me as a roommate and you will really love me as a roommate by the way if, you know what? I've been a, I, I've been a satisfactory roommate in the past and I was gonna say this you know what you know about millennials how they've lived at home a lot of them you see people. Well, maybe they lived in the dorms or they commute. And I think more and more people almost commute, too, back and forth. 
so they live with their parents during college even. My point here is, is that I lived off campus, so too. I did do that. I paid for rent. So I did learn some responsibility that way. I would say, right, isn't that a responsibility learning method is by living on your own throughout college, which I did even though it was you know, only living in the dorms for my first two years of college as an undergrad at Detroit Mercy. My following two years as a junior and senior, I lived in Berkeley and with three other guys and actually uh, two different pairs of roommates, which is funny. Uh, two dudes from Mexico, literally from Mexico, that were exchange students who Nick and I, my buddy who I bring up a lot, we met, we became big time friends with. The one guy's actually moving to Michigan full time now. So, And then after they moved back home for the time being to work at Magna, which is an engineering place, which is also you know based in Michigan too. I think it's, well, it's nation, it's worldwide too. Well, then we had a different pair of roommates after that. So we really got, I guess, cultured and had many experiences. And like I said, we had to pay for rent. So I think we learned some kind of responsibility because of that too. And Vito, you know what? I always offer my services. If you're somebody out there listening and you're tuning into this very popular podcast, the Too Bad Hombres podcast, I offer my services. You want to call up, you want to look up uh, how to be successful, just come find me, the doc. And Vito will attest as my um, success story that I'm a pretty successful cat. Um, I got my own office, my own home. I'm paying the bills. I have a vehicle that I pay the lease on. I got uh, a family that I'm taking care of. So things are going pretty well in my household. So I'm more than willing to continue to dole out the advice through you on this podcast and to everybody out there that the secret to success for all the millennials is work for Google, work for Apple, become a computer guy. Stop looking at the <laughs> like adult content. That easy, right? Stop looking at adult content. Stop writing for article. Stop writing for websites. Start clicking and figuring out how to write code. You know how to write code, Vito? No. Why not? Do you know how to write code? Yeah. You know how you to do write actually? Code? Yeah, HTML. I Google HTML, and I think the website got started. I started it. Me and Adam started it together. We coded it and uh, kind of figured out how to well, get so stuff Well, so it's easy there. enough. If you just Googled it, it's easy enough for me just to pick up by Googling it, right? You definitely... I mean, so it is easy, actually. I've heard of code. Actually, I have friends that do code. You know, I'm They're like you. software I engineers. I, but have you no don't, idea. I have no idea how to code. I was about to say, you're not that good. But you make the big bucks there. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. You know, with what I'm doing. And more and more, you sound like Donald J. Trump. Like, you should write a, a book, a tell-all book about your success as a businessman, about how you... Got into this business, no. what you've done, how you've not the brokered art, some deals. Not the art of the deal, the art of the steal. <laughs> <laughs> how to hustle your art way to success. Stealing my way through life. <laughs> the doc. No, no, no. <laughs> that'd, be, no. that'd be the title of your book. The art of the steal, how to let the government take care of you every single month. <laughs> <laughs> the doc has it all for you in his latest novel. Get it on Amazon today. Six ninety nine. dollars It'd be a very cheap book, too. No. Trust me on Amazon. How to earn your disability one month at a time. <laughs> The doc can teach you all about it. And it, we hope that we taught you something more than that as well on this week's edition of Two Very Bad fun Hombres. edition, sir. I had a good time. Thank you, Doc. Thank you to everybody listening in. And tune into episode number nine of the podcast next week. Goodbye, guys. I was trying to get an idea. I want them dead presidents. I want to put